Oh, you heard him, Mr. Clark. I called the public work session of Portsmouth City Council scheduled for today, Tuesday, the 22nd of May, 2018, to order. Madam Clerk, will you uh, call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Clark? Here. <coughs> Excuse me. Mrs. Lucas Burke? Here. Mr. Moody? Here. Ms. Simmons? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Dr. Whitaker? Mayor Rowe? Here. Like that. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of City Council, if you would um, please give me a moment. I, it is my pleasure to welcome the newest member to the City Manager's team, Mrs. Cheryl Spivey, Spivey, the new Chief Financial Officer for the City of Portsmouth. Allow me to give a little background. Mrs. Spivey's professional career began as an accountant and her experience progressed to positions that include finance manager, debt and risk manager, administrative services director, and chief financial officer. As chief financial officer, she fully directed and managed all financial activities and services, accounting, operations, budget, enterprise resource planning, um, cash management and investments, financial reporting and analysis, risk management, and procurement. Mrs. Spivey comes to the city of Portsmouth from the city of Fayetteville, North Carolina, where she served as chief financial officer. She has also served in Cape Fear, Public Utility Authority, Wake County, Town of Cary, as well as local government commission. Her educational background includes a bachelor's degree in business administration and accounting from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. In addition, she is a certified public accountant. Her professional background includes many memberships in financial organizations, such as the Government Finance Officers Association. Mrs. Spivey accomplished numerous financial operation objectives through her career. She monitored and analyzed fiscal accounting practices of local governments, managed debt portfolios and issuance of bonds ranging from $150 million to $256 million. She, can, she has reconciled $1 billion of capital projects, guided significant improvements in financial position through better communication of complex financial information transparency of financial reporting and procurement practices. She has also um, been able to identify immeasurable cost savings, directed development of financial policies to ensure public funds were utilized efficiently, improved bond ratings successfully, utilized financial modeling to enhance flexibility and to decrease costs internally, implemented a local small disadvantaged business enterprise program, strengthened staffing of the finance department, and managed nearly 50 million of federal and state grants with no findings. Mrs. Spivey's vast knowledge and commitment to finance and local municipalities aligned with her demonstrated achievement makes her a key strategic partner in advancing our new Portsmouth. Mrs. Spivey is married to Mr. Troy Spivey and has one adult son who is recently married. Mrs. Spivey has bought a home in Portsmouth, which she closed on yesterday, and she will have her cable set up tomorrow because her <laughs> husband works from home. Let's welcome Mrs. Spivey, Cheryl Spivey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, and welcome on behalf of council to the great city of Portsmouth and to a great, great city uh, team. Uh, we have an awesome team. In fact, we have the dream team. And uh, thank you for joining us. Well, well thank you. And I, um, I um, am, am honored to have been selected for the position and, um, and look forward to, um, to ser serving Portsmouth and the residents of Portsmouth and, um, and getting to know the city a lot better. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. City uh, Council will allow me to, for the introduction. <laughs> During uh, your January 22, 2018 public work session, City Council requested the city manager to develop a patch to address concerns about residential infill housing development. On February 13, 2018, City Council, you passed a resolution requesting a zoning code amendment to address City Council's concern regarding new residential development on small lots that can be in 
um, compatible with surrounding neighborhoods. Tonight, Mr. John Hartley, Planning Administrator in the Planning Department, will provide an overview of the code amendment prepared by the Planning Department in consultation with the City Attorney's Office to address this concern. The code amendment is a public hearing item on tonight's regular session agenda. The second presentation, the next generation 911, Mr. Daniel Jones, Chief Information Officer, will discuss the technology transition from legacy 911 infrastructure to next generation 911 infrastructure in coordination <coughs> with regional and state 911 service boards. Mr. Hartley. Thank you, Dr. Patton. Mayor Row, members of, of City Council. <coughs> now, let's try to get the right one here. Uh, one of the items on your agenda for public hearing uh, is uh, an item that you requested the staff focus on. Uh, there was a resolution, uh, as the manager indicated, uh, passed in February of this year. Uh, addressing the lot sizes in the zoning ordinance. Uh, just to kind of recap where, where we've been, uh, back in 2010, prior to 2010, there were 13 districts, uh, residential districts, with the ordinance in 2010, that was consolidated into four districts. Um, the amendments that are proposed <coughs> that you'll be considering tonight increase the both the lot size and the lot width in three of those four districts and i'll explain that in a little more detail in a minute um, the amendments also only apply to new subdivisions they do not affect existing lots so they're so we're not creating a lot of non-conforming lots uh, that that may have been out there historically or those that have been created in the last eight years um, the provisions also would allow narrower lots in terms of the lot width if that's the it, that's consistent with the existing lots that are there. So the idea being that if it's consistent with the the uh, form of development that's already there, uh, the lots the lot widths can be can be reduced. And uh, the amendments also establish a 90-day sunset for any plats that have been submitted to date. And we have received a number of plats. Uh, some of you are aware of, uh, of where those are located. Um, they've been submitted, and, and the ordinance, uh, the amendments would create a 90-day sunset uh, for those plats. Could you elaborate on that point, please? Could you elaborate on that point, please? Yeah, the, the idea being that once somebody's submitted a plat, they've expended funds, they've hired a surveyor and an engineer to, uh, and oftentimes acquired the property with the intent to subdivide. And at this point, they've expended funds to do that. And typically uh, in the zoning and planning realm, once they've initiated that process, you can't just pull the rug out from under their <coughs> under their feet. And it's it's a concept called vested rights that they've expended money uh, trying to do what they're trying to do, and you can't just cut them off at the knees and say it's no good anymore. Is that a simple? Is that a straightforward answer? Any questions? We're not changing the rules mid application. Correct. Correct. So these amendments would apply to anybody as of the date they're formally adopted. Anybody who submitted something in advance of that date is allowed to continue as long as they complete the application, uh, the process within 90 days. Any questions on that point? <coughs> Excuse me. This table is probably the meat of, of all that, that is proposed. It's a little complicated, but essentially this first column is the is the 2018 zoning. These are the four zoning districts that are on the books now. The next column are the districts that were around prior to 2010. And this shows, uh, uh, this column shows what the minimum lot sizes were, uh, both of the existing as well as the old districts. 
uh, and then the lot widths. And these last two columns are what is proposed. And there's also a summary of this chart um, in your staff report. Uh, just to give you an example, let's, if we look at this UR district right here, which really applies to, to over 50% of the city's residentially zoned property, the current zoning allows a minimum lot size of, of 5,000 square feet with a lot width of 35 feet. And more, more, more than likely, it's this 35 feet that's creating the, the biggest angst around the community with infill development because that's a very narrow lot. When you have a driveway, you essentially eliminate, eliminate it all on street parking. And so parking becomes an issue. These are the old districts that existed prior to 2010. So you had what was called the RS-75. Again, that's probably the most dominant zoning district in the city. But you also had the RS-60 and the RS-50 that were all combined in this UR district. And if you look at that, the RS-75 had lot sizes of 7,500, 6,000, and 5,000. What was adopted in 2010 was the low ball, if you want to call it that, the lowest or the, or the smallest lot size of that group of lots. What we are proposing uh, as part of your amendments tonight is that the lot size be increased, again, for new subdivisions, not existing lots, from 5,000 to 6,000 square feet. But the big difference is really the lot width. Uh, it would be an increase from 35 to 60 feet of frontage. The idea being that the combination of the lot size and the lot width is really what's creating uh, incompatible infill development throughout the city. In, in looking at all of this, and, it, and it's true, it, you can go on it through each one of these groups. They're, they're grouped by essentially background color. Um, we're recommending changes in three, these three districts, the GR, UR, and URH, but not the NR, because that applies to, I think it's 50 lots in the city. It's a very small area of the city that's zoned. Uh, the existing frontage uh, and lot size has not appeared to be a problem. Um, and so we really did, we're not recommending recommending any changes there. But it's the GR, UR, and URH that we are recommending changes on. Are there any questions about the table and how, how to interpret that? What, what formula, John, was used to come up with the, uh, the numbers, the lot size and lot width? For, for the amendments proposed? Yes. Um, Best guess is the, is, the, is the best way to answer. We did not do an extensive evaluation. If you remember, the request was made in February. Here we are coming back to you in May with what we're calling the residential lot patch. patch. Mm -hmm. So this is a temporary fix to avoid the most egregious uh, kinds of development that people are screaming about in the community. We will, in the zoning ordinance uh, revisions, take a, a much uh, closer look at uh, what what these what the lot sizes are that were adopted in 2010. We may come back and tweak those a little bit. We we've, we've even talked about creating a fifth residential district to make it all work, mm -hmm. but it's a huge amount of data to, to kind of sort through and figure out what's, what's the most exact best fit. Also, keep in mind that your infill development, and, and Billy can speak to this, um, the infill development is one of your revenue generators that's out there increasing the tax base of the city. So you don't want to cut off all infill development. So we've tried to take a step in the right direction with figures we think are, are pretty accurate. The, again, keep in mind, I don't know what I just did. 
I hit it. There we go. We're back. <laughs> Keep in mind that we've we've also accounted for for some of the best fit with this allowing narrower lots where it's consistent with the with the lots that are in the block. So going back to the table, if if uh, again the UR, if you had 50 foot wide lots all along the block, you could actually reduce through that provision, the, the lot width down to 50 feet. Again, so it's consistent with the neighborhood. And that's, I think, what, what the intent was. That's our understanding of the intent. Question? In reference to the UR and the URH below it, you know, looking at the recommendations, the UR is the 60-foot frontage with the 6,000-square-foot lot size, and the 100 is 50-foot. So the 100 is a s smaller width, but it's a larger square footage. What's the, what's the difference, like example of neighborhoods between those two? Because they're so similar, uh, it's not a lot of difference between the bottom two. Yeah, you're talking about the GR here? No, the UR and Down the URH, the, the bottom two. Okay. Down at the bottom. But these are the, the no. URH are, are primarily townhouse and multifamily. Are you in the TAN or the developments? Well, I was comparing the, the bottom two because the UR has a 60 foot lot width with a square foot of 6,000, but when you drop to the one below it, it has more square footage yes. but less width. And I was just trying to figure out what the yeah. difference. Basically, the UR district, the RT actually stood for residential townhouse, the RM for residential multifamily, the OR for residential office. So there are really very few single family residences in, in, in those zoning districts. Um, so if you're developing a multifamily project, that's primarily the, the lot size and, and width that the parent parcel would have to adhere to uh, before it's developed. So what's the Did UR? I answer that question, Mr. Clark? Well, I, I get it, but I just, you know, it's not a lot of difference between the bottom two. No. You know, it's, it's, it would almost seem like coming a happy medium between the two and just have one that covered a lot more area. And that's, you know, it's just so many different variations. Yes. Because it's almost like if you average between the 65 and the 7,500 and then went between the 50 and 60, you could cover all of them. Right. And that's why I was just curious. Again, we're trying to find that, trying to hit that sweet spot where we're, we're addressing the infill development that is, that is considered inappropriate, but not, not uh, prohibit all new infill development because it, that's a revenue source for the city. So, and this is a patch. This is a temporary, what we see as a temporary fix until we can really get in and dig into the, to the meat. Did you have a question? There, go ahead. So what's the difference? I get that the, the URH is, is townhouse type things. So what's the UR? The UR is the, is the, these are all single family detached zoning districts. So. So one of the reasons for the 60 foot width on the UR is because they're detached homes versus yes. the 50 in the URH because they're con actually connected. Well, and, and if you look at what was historically out there prior to 2010, the, the lot sizes range from 5,000 to 7,500. The lot widths range from 50 to 70. What was adopted in 2010 35. was 5,000 and 35 feet of width. And again, this is probably the most problematic aspect that was adopted in 2010, the, width, the lot width. To give an example, RS-75 might be Castle Heights. Is that true? Oh, I don't know what cast. I, mo let, me, let me help you with that one. Okay. I think that's more likely an RS 100. I think if you want RS 75, think Cavalier Manor, okay. Highland Biltmore, those are RS 75. The predominant zoning in the older part of the city is RS 75. And one thing I'll just mention, as you went down to those lower districts, you had smaller and smaller amounts of land zoned for that. So the, the predominant would have been RS-75 if you went up into Churchland. Everything from RS-100 to RS-150 is pretty. So like pretty along Portsmouth Boulevard where we've had the complaints of the infills? RS-75. RS-75, okay. okay. 
Bill had a question. Since we're doing this uh, patch to, to, to alleviate some problems with infill in, in some specific communities, have, have we presented this to any civic leagues or any residents within we, those communities? We have not. This is a request from city council. We've responded to that request. Okay, so, so I know that there, there were some problems, but was it an error in the calculation? Because it seems to be uh, 10 foot width per 1,000 square lots. So it seemed like, I mean, when that one was passed, 5,000 should have been at a 50. Um, if you're looking at them, 7,070, 6,060. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not going to take any. Uh, I wasn't here when the new ordinance was adopted in okay. 2010. Right. Uh, and neither was Bob. That's what we both inherited when we got here. Uh, that was done by the previous staff. Okay. So, so I was just curious, looking at it, you know, so most of the ones we're having the big infill issues with the multiple houses would fall under that UR. So, for example, so they're they're taking RS 75s and subdividing them into two to meet the one above it, the 5,000. 35 foot right so they can get two out of one if it's an rs-75 actually they could get if they had two if they had two lots under the rs-75 they four. can actually do three let me let 35 me, and 30 yeah. that would be 15,000 square feet for two lots uh -huh. as the minimum lot size now you can do actually three lots now the frontage may be a little bit different but in terms of lot area let, let me go on and show a Let's couple see, examples tell, tell us what these pictures are yeah <clears throat> this is the development um, at the intersection of Deep Creek and Greenwood. And, Greenwood. and uh, originally, I believe it was three lots. It's now five. And there are other provisions that come into play, but if you've ever been out there, uh, this is the house, the backyard of this house. <laughs> um, it, it's no it has no backyard. It's, no backyard. it's 15 yeah. feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's 15 feet. Um, so that's one example, and then and then if you go uh, and and this is probably more uh, typical of the of the complaints uh, that you're receiving. This is actually on Deep Creek Boulevard. Uh, this is a little sketch. Basically, they took one of these big lots, split it down the middle, and built these two houses. And so, would that have been an RF seventy five? Uh, probably, probably, yes. See and this is this is a uh, we probably had 30 30 40 in the last couple of years so uh, of lot splits along along these lines so now with, with this patch, patch that wouldn't be allowed correct mm -hmm. Pri primarily a function of a again the lot size but also the lot width, width. Mm -hmm. yes it just looks so silly besides well, all those one story and it's, it's everywhere. They, it's also it's, it's occurred in Merrimack Point. It's happened all it's over yes. the city. Yes. And that's why, again, going back to the table, it's important to, to address both GR and UR. Those are the two critical, I, I, I think something like 90 percent, certainly the 90 percent of the single family is in the, one of those two zoning okay. categories. Something that's interesting, Mayor, members of council, the persons who are buying the homes yeah. are not the complainants. No. It's the citizens who are already having homes existing in the neighborhoods who are concerned. But um, that Deep Creek area, which has a significant number, some of those homes are so close that you can actually see you're right there in the other person's house, um, which, which, but you know. But they aren't the ones complaining. Yeah. Not the builders. They are not, no, no, the, own, the owners are not complaining. It's the citizens who have homes already existing and feel that these homes are coming into their community, lots are being split, and the homes are so close. So it kind of takes away what was the existing character of a community. Dr. Whitaker. Yep. Um, when, on your first slide, when you said that the patch is going to apply to uh, new subdivisions, um, and also I think it says resub, resubdivisions, yes. are the resubdivisions what you just showed us where they come in and build yes. on the old lot? Yes, and actually, actually, by definition, they're 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 the same. But I use both terms just to be clear that it's not just taking a 40-acre parcel. Not that we have that many, 
put a 40 acre parcel and subdividing it. It's also the the larger lot that's now being cut up into into two or two combi two lots combined to make three. Uh, we're seeing all kinds of combinations like that going down to that 5,000 square foot, 35 foot frontage requirement, and they're squeeze they. Builders are squeezing as much as they can out of the parcels that are there. Um, minimum standards become maximum performance. Favorite saying of mine. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yes, Mr. Um, Vincent Jones. Daniel Jones will now make a presentation on the next generation 911. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of City Council. This evening I'll be briefing you regarding the presentation of the upcoming transition from a legacy 911 call routing technologies to what is now referred to as the next generation or ESINET, which is E-S-I-N-E-T or Emergency Services Internet Protocol Networks. Throughout the presentation this evening we'll highlight key areas of transition including technology transition, diagram of a legacy 911 network, diagram of what a new next generation 911 network, the state deployment plan, and the state deployment schedule. So in 1957, the National Association of Fire Chiefs recommended a single number for reporting fire emergencies. Then in 1967, the President's Commission on Law Enforcement as well recommended that a single number be adopted. After these, recommend, after these recommendations, in 1968, AT&T established the number that we now refer to as 911 for emergency reporting. It is estimated that the municipalities of Hampton Roads adopted an integrated 911 system in the late 80s or early 90s. Since that adoption, the 911 system routing technology has not been upgraded or enhanced since. Currently, the legacy 911 equipment cannot intake emergency requests from text messages, emails, pictures, or videos. With the transition of the next generation 911 or EZNet, citizenry will have the ability to request emergency, emergency services through multiple avenues. The EZNet routing, when completed, will be in the end IP or I3 compliant. PSAPs will be able to seamlessly connect through the EZNet, allowing information sharing and transferring nationwide without delay. So in essence, you could dial, if you were trying to reach emergency services in California, when this is nationwide, you can dial 911 here and it can be seamlessly transferred all the way to California without calling different 911 centers. The next generation 911 or EZNet relies greatly on local GIS information. That information will be used primarily for address or location validation and additional layers as are tracked. This information during the aggregation of the call is what provides a higher degree of accuracy of the location of the caller. So as when the EZNet is deployed and you're on the interstate, it can actually pinpoint where you are on the interstate rather than just displaying that you're on Interstate 64 or something of that nature. So here's what you would refer to as currently or the legacy 911 network. As you see, the originating call service either coming from a landline or a cell phone or through what is considered a VoIP or a voice over IP comes through either the positioning center or through what is referred to as a selective router and then either queries against the MSAG, which is a master street address guide, or the Alley database, which is the automatic location identifier. 
and then it's transferred then to the PSAP or the 911 center, and then services are dispatched. With the new AZNet, you have all the same avenues in which citizenry can contact emergency services, but then you have what is referred to here as POIs, or points of interconnect. And then once the points of interconnect reach into the AZNet, then you have the GIS layers, your road center lines, address points. Um, you actually get then an X, Y, and Z coordinate rather than an X and a Y. And then of course, after that, it's dispatched to the PSAP as well. So as defined by the state 911 board, the deployment plan is estimated or is already underway for, fire, for Firefax Alexandria in Northern Virginia region. They're already in the midst of their migration. The Tidewater region has been selected as second, and then of course the Richmond area selected as third on a basis of population. The deployment schedule, as I said, the Northern Virginia has already began their migration, and they have until the fourth quarter of this year to complete that migration. The Tidewater area will begin their migration in January of 2019, and we'll have until June of 2019 to have that migration completed. But the state needs to receive a confirmation by October of this year as to the, who the vendor of the ESINET will be. And with that, any questions? Do you understand? <laughs> Do you understand? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that's good. That's really good. Um, who are the options uh, for the vendors uh, who's being projected? Right now, the Northern Virginia area secured a contract as cooperation with the state with AT&T. The region right now is looking to do a separate RFP as the talk, just to see any competing vendors that can provide the same AZNet service. But I will say there's a maximum of two or three in the nation that can provide this service anyway. So this is a regional? Yes. This is not just Portsmouth, this is... Oh. Because all the region connect to the, to what is referred to as the selective routers that do routing for Hampton Roads. For those coordinates, uh, I, I know if you're out on the bay or uh, maybe, maybe Chesapeake Bay or something, mm -hmm. uh, and dial 911, I know in the past it has been difficult to pinpoint your location. Will this correct that? Absolutely. Because as that works now, you have zones that are drawn out, and that's the responding agency or municipality that's notified. Now with the integration and reliance on GIS, that's a very accurate line of where you're actually located that the um, call gets transferred to. Okay. That'll be a vast improvement. Mm -hmm. Sure. Will that tracking mechanism be triggered when you dial 911, or is that a constant monitoring that the state will have of individuals? No, once the migration takes place, you're never going to know any difference except that on the back end, you will, they will be able to dispatch and see your location with greater accuracy than they can know. Well, I, I guess what I'm asking, Will, will, the, will the state be able to monitor your location even without you dialing 911? Mm -hmm. Not from a, from your cell phone provider? From, from, uh, from any, even maybe the car itself. Well, that, that can be accomplished now with the right technology. That's not The state, happen. through the state? Well, any, any cell phone that you carry can be monitored, your GPS location, your last time you signed in from any device? No, I'm talking particularly with the state having that data now. The state would, because the 911 services board requests a number of calls and things of that nature, but call specific information would follow the same workflow as it does now. That wouldn't be no different. Okay, and also, um, who would be responsible for the privacy of that information? Is that regional, local, or how is that going to be managed at the state level? The, the privacy of? Of your information, as far as tracking information that will be gathered. Um, well, I mean, you, you're not particularly gathering information. You're using the GIS layers, which are just 
normal road points or address center lines. The information that is gathered is when you call 911, you give your name and address, and that will still be logged and kept with records of retention as, as it always is. Uh, Mr. Jones, could you share with council where we are with our radio tower, our new system, and how we are looking in being prepared to migrate to when this happens? As far as with the public safety radio system, or what is referred to as the LMR, land mobile radio, um, we have executed a contract with the vendor. That vendor is Motorola. We are in the, well, we're in the project phase before the design review. And that is, they're staging the equipment. We're looking at the current tires as well as the coverage for the new tower. And then once those are, once those designs are approved, then we'll begin construction and transferring to the new P25 compliance system. No. What, what's the cost of that? The transition. radio system of the transition, um, it's been years that this has been yes. previous to my coming, so we would have to get the total cost over the years. It would be good to, to know what, uh, yeah. what the cost mm -hmm. is. Yeah. yeah, we can get that for you. Yes. The, uh, when this new system's up, new tower and everything, will that improve the radio communication specifically in the Churchland area? Because that has been a struggle for years. Yes. That is the purpose, I think. That the, the, new, or the new site for the second tower will not only provide the coverage, but the redundancy if the one side does go down. Besides technology itself, what is the mandate for doing this? Is it a executive order or legislation? It's not legislation. Um, it is um, an upgrade of technology and a vendor wanting to retire technology based on the life cycle and the maintenance cost of it, as well as the benefits that come with the new technology. Other questions? One of the things uh, I asked uh, Mr. Jones, which I, I couldn't remember, maybe you could remember, when he said that 911 was developed in 1968, I asked him, what did we do before that? And he looked at me, in other words, to say, <laughs> I probably wasn't here, you were here, what did you do? But I cannot remember not having oh, 911, and he really... In the, in the front of the phone book, it had your emergency contact numbers. Oh, that's and right. it was yeah. police, fire, and they were different phone numbers, and it was printed in your phone book. And that's because I remember when the 911 started, because it, I think it was the 80s here, but before that, that you had open the phone book, you didn't remember it, and they used to give you stickers to go on your rotary phone well, so you can call that. emergency numbers. That is what I remember those stickers. Mm -hmm. So um, on the sheet where it shows the deployment schedule, um, for the cities that are not um, listed here, I mean, so they'll just stay with the regular old 911 mm -hmm. or no, this is the entire state. This, this is, is. Mm -hmm. okay. Deployed so region. by regions. Okay. Because the region is what all of one region connects to a selective point for the routing of the 911 calls. So this is the entire state in some manner. Okay. What is Jefferson? Jefferson Avenue. Uh, yes, that is. Yeah. yeah. Tell us how you gave the example that you could call 911 here for an emergency in California. How does how does that work? Now or then? Then in the future. In how the will, future. will that work? In, yeah, in the future, if you were say you were one to check on a family member of some sort, when you dial that, then they would transfer it back into the Azinet, the cloud, and then it migrates or it gets transferred to California. Now, if the PSAP is not an adjoining or we'll say close to where you call, then they have to manually find that number for the PSAP, the dispatchers, and then say there's a call, and then trying to go from here to California, that would be impossible probably. Yeah. Well, not impossible, but. Another problem that happens on occasion with the existing 911, uh, you can be in Portsmouth, say on the Westover Bridge, and you want to call 911 and you get uh, oh, Norfolk, that's right. uh, Chesapeake, will this correct it? And, and that's going back to the same point. As currently now, there are areas within a, as your cell phone pings against the tower and it determines your location, that boundary is outlined if you're in that, 
then it automatically gets routed to, say, Norfolk instead of Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. okay. With this, it will use all those coordinates and say you're traveling on the West Norfolk Bridge, you're still in Portsmouth, or you're getting ready to cross into a neighboring jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Other questions? All right. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, at this time, I'm going to ask Mr. James Wright uh, to come up and give you um, an update on the pavilion, the seawall, and um, the um, port side. Good afternoon. I mean, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Member of the City Council. Um, Similar to last night, um, I gave you the update on the pavilion. We have the scaffolding in place. Um, all the metal has been fabricated. Uh, the contractor will start work tomorrow and he will be completed on time Thursday as I indicated last night with the uh, support pricing. Uh, that's being at the sleeve is being attached to the existing vertical yes, sir. members? Mm -hmm. This is being welded, bolted? Right. Welded and some bolts and there's a plate and it's uh, almost like I said mentioned last night it's pretty much like a brace mm -hmm. to hold everything in place. Keep it from moving. And, and a second opinion uh, with, with the with IMG in the process of getting. They were there today. He'll update on that. Uh, any any update day. on that? Um, IMG had their folks on site. I can't speak to as what they did. So. Their folks are the engineer that uh, that company they were going to hire for another opinion. I say a second opinion. Another opinion. According to Mr. Wright uh, today, IMG had um, two lawyers and engineers and Mr. Ken McDonald on site, site today. Okay. Um, and they were, uh, it was visual inspection and um, they did not ask Mr. Wright any questions and uh, he was there while they were on the premises. I wasn't present. Our, 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 engineer, our, our engineer, engineer was there, was but present. I, was, I wasn't okay. present. So there were no okay. questions. That you so that's in the process. Right. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing will allow the festival park to open on Friday for the Emoja Festival. We will open the festival park Thursday afternoon and then um, once everything's complete we'll open up certain sections actually inside the pavilion. And, and what about the restrooms? Will people be able to go into the restroom building that's inside? On the East Plaza. On the Plaza? On the East, East Plaza, Plaza, which is adjacent to the water. Okay. Um, Seawall, um, we are currently... Go over the canopy one more time. Mm -hmm. When does the contractor come in to remove that and the length of time? Um, comes in June 2nd. So it takes about two weeks to remove. Weather depending. So does that mean the concerts that are scheduled beyond June 15th should be fine? I Ish. can't speak to the concerts. One would think. One would think, mm -hmm. yes. <clears throat> so the the seawall um, work is ongoing. Um, sheet piles and age piles should be completed sometime in that August range. And so after August, you'll start to see it forming up and the it'll start look like the decks start to go in. We'll look at a completion sometime uh, in November. That's um, that, for that section, we are currently reviewing the final plans for the holiday end piece um, and we'll bid that out sometime within the next two months. And what's the last port, port, side. port side? Okay. <laughs> we, opened, we, opened, we opened bids for port side. Um, the contractor should mobilize to the site um, the first part of June for that first full week in June. Um, we're familiar with the contractor. It's the same contractor that did church library. Okay. Dr. Matt, could you um, also uh, while he's up, give a report on the Churchland Bridge. Yes, um, he can give a report on the Churchland Bridge uh, present and uh, when we're ready to start the actual rebuild of the bridge. So there are two pieces to that. So currently what you see out there now is not the Churchland Bridge project, it's a public utility project that had a sewer line failure. It was going to be a part of the bridge project, but because of the condition of the sewer, they had to do that first. So that's why you see the work that's going on out there right now. Um, we j I just spoke to the Coast Guard last week, I forget which day. Um, it looks like we're going to get our permits soon. Um, we're clear with VDOT, so I'm looking to go out for bid for the bridge, uh, advertised sometime next month. Army Corps. 
do we have a have we have with core? That. Mm -hmm. That's a new. Are the utilities point. attached to the bridge or? The, their, what the water line will be hung from the bridge, and then Verizon and whoever else needs to go across the bridge and conduit will relocate their facilities and go across and conduit. Questions? The present work on the bridge, um, which is public utilities, will be completed by August. August? Yes. So we'll have one lane traffic? Until August. Well. And once we start the bridge, we will have two-lane traffic for possibly 18 months to two years. <coughs> yes, sir. You know, uh, I know that it's double solid line on the bridge now, mm -hmm. but uh, you, you know, when you come up on the crest of that bridge, and, and sometimes people are impatient, and uh, could, I could see a scenario where somebody tries to pass. Jesus. So I'm wondering if these uh, these cones, uh, plastic cones, mm. uh, at least in the portion of it and the crest, where, where you can't see what's over the crest, mm -hmm. if the placement of some of those might be a good safety feature. Like at um, Shenandoah. Yeah, what would it yeah. cost exactly. to put those across? Exactly. Um, we can look at those, those delineators, the, the single pole so you can see them. Um, you don't want to put anything any more substantial than that because of the clearance, and you'd have to have a wider bridge to do that. So well, we can take a look at those, though. Okay, good. Yeah, they're, the, they're the plastic yellow things. That's what we're talking right, about. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's Sh oh, Shenandoah's that's, got them. Uh, that's a good idea. Yes, sir. This is a separate bridge issue than the Churchland Bridge. Um, this is the West Norfolk Bridge, and I'm um, curious, why is it that now uh, we're seeing this major buildup of traffic um, on the West Norfolk Bridge, Martin Luther King Expressway in the uh, afternoons now. Truck traffic. It's what? Truck traffic going in and out of uh, VIG. Um, that ramp, when they get up, when they're either going to VIG or coming from VIG, um, traffic on that ramp will back. Because they're so slow, it takes so long to accelerate or so, so long for them to accelerate getting onto 164 if you're going westbound it'll back traffic up quite quite a distance. Um, it'll pretty much render that one lane unusable for a certain amount of time, and so that's you're seeing a lot of that. Um, the advantage of having that built, it took a lot of truck traffic off our streets, but it's backed up that, that part of 164. So that's um, that increased cargo now activity at the terminal, that's why we're seeing, okay. Also, those folks that used to go straight to Bowers Hill now are cutting across uh, that cut to get on that 164 now. Instead of going straight, now they got to cut through. So that's where some additional traffic is also. And then the convenience of the coming off of 264 to get on um, the Martin Luther King to get over there. That you, I mean, when we're, you're leaving in the afternoon, most of the traffic is cutting to go this way instead of where we all went to Frederick Boulevard or wherever out. Um, and since the bridge, which, you know, my eyes, I'm going that way because the bridge, you know, it, it's pretty close. So it's, traffic's gonna continue. Well, to pick up on Dr. Whitaker's comment, it's get question. Worse. Uh, would it be appropriate to ask VDOT to study the feasibility of restricting trucks to the right lane? We could, and I, I'm going to, uh, Mr. Uh, if I could call Mr. Baldwin, who is I mean, for, transportation. Before we do that, I mean, okay. is that something we want the city manager to, to inquire? Okay. I, th I thought that's yes. what I thought that's what Mr. I thought you were saying that's what the problem is. Those trucks are. In that. I mean, they're not all all in there. I think what the mayor's mentioned is he's to, to restrict them. I mean, it's one truck over in the left lane and you back up both lanes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. At least you'd have a fast mm -hmm. lane that would be the, the we, in, we do that? inside mm -hmm. lane. Okay. Restrict the trucks to the outside oh, lane. Okay. 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 Yeah, like they do going across the bridge, Berkeley Bridge. The signs tell the trucks to stay in the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We want the city manager to pursue that. Done hard to ask. Yes. Okay. All right. We'll get our team and get that request made. Right. 
what, one other thing that's a problem, High Street, when you're coming off um, the ramp, there needs to be a stoplight there. A lot of trucks get off. Yeah. A lot of those big trucks get off, and then you there's only two lanes. And maybe if it was a third lane, maybe it would help also, but it is terrible getting off with it when those trucks are trying to turn left to go on uh, Virginia Avenue and to PIT. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a big, big issue. It's going to be uh, an accident. Yes. Uh, Mayor, if I may, uh, when the um, um, Martin Luther King opened, immediately the team here saw the problem. We met with the past, um, can't call his name, who's now over the Hampton Road. We met with Mr. Otterback. We have meetings with Mr. Otterback's team here. Um, they said they would look at it, but there was no movement. So I went back to Mr. Otterback, and I have also met with the new person who has taken Mr. Otterback's um, position. However, there was something, some reasoning that they gave, but we continue to press that. Uh, th no, they say there is a light right there uh, on the corner by the church, and and we have said that light needs to be moved, but there is some issue. The, the light that she is referring to was a temporary light for the Turnpike Road project, so it's been removed. What the, at the at Constitution and High, what uh, why there's no light at uh, MLK at that ramp was the traffic projections when they were doing the design and when they first opened did not meet the warrants mm -hmm. or you have to do a signal warrant analysis before you install a traffic signal did not meet the signal warrants um, but it can certainly be revisited um, situations change to can be reanalyzed so we can bring that up before we go can we do we have a consensus that we want the city manager to the push. make the okay. yes Yes. Yeah. Well, in, in addition to that, you know, I know before the flyer was con connected to the West Norfolk Bridge, it used to drop off on Bayview Boulevard, and the truck route back then was down Mount Vernon Avenue. Later it changed to Chautauqua Avenue and Virginia Avenue. But with the new MLK, if the trucks are going to PIT, they don't need to get off at High Street. They should be taking that last exit that circles them around through the entrance to PIT, the last exit prior to entering the Midtown Tunnel. So we might need to evaluate that and it'd be a no through trucks now because I know that was the truck truck route, but that was pre MLK connector. So they really shouldn't be going down High Street and through Virginia Avenue unless they have a destination in there. So they're trying to circumvent it to cut through there. They, that shouldn't be a truck route anymore because they have the on ramp that's right there off of Virginia Avenue, you know, at the overpass prior to MLK by Sugar Creek, Sugar Hill. And uh, so they really shouldn't be cutting through Virginia Avenue and High Street anymore. They sure do. Okay, to include that comment? We'll include that also. All right. Okay. One last thing, what we do to is our traffic you discussion. Uh, we got a, a cool request from the Old Town Business Association oh, yes. for his for signs on the interstate. Yes. State control roads. Yes. Um, I responded, copied council. Yes. Can you come up with um, what we need to do. Yes, we can, can put this on the work. Yes, we, we will have a report back. We, uh, Mr. Um, Vincent Jones, has worked uh, with the uh, proponents of the Old Town Business Association, have all of the information from the state and the cost of what it would uh, incur for that. So we'll put that on the work session. It's, it's really ironic that you're traveling east on 264 in Portsmouth and you'll see a sign for some attraction in Norfolk, but none in Portsmouth. Yeah. Right. Not even the Children's Museum. Right. That. Yeah. How goofy is that? We'll bring that. We'll bring that to a work session. Other traffic questions. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he has one more. And this is also with the um, when you're getting off on Frederick, and you know you can bear to the left to go MLK, or you can go to Frederick. Mm -hmm. Anyone that's the stop right on the crest of that hill is gonna get cream because folks come off, it says 25 on that ramp, but it's a hill and you can't see until you get to the top of the hill. Uh, I mean, a warning sign or blinking sign or something to warn people because 
sooner or later, folks are putting on brakes. If, if you come too fast and there's a car just sitting right at the top of the crest and you come over a little too fast, you, you're putting on brakes. And then the folks behind you are, are breaking down from 50, you know, 55. So you 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 know what I'm talking Where? about? It's, it's We're going west on on Frederick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a tall hill yeah. before you get to Frederick. Oh, wait, it's coming that way to get to Frederick. Yeah, yeah. This it's, it's, it's also a, a big hazard. Uh, and, and the only reason I mention this now, one or two folks have said, and I, I, I don't think about it, I guess, because if you travel it enough, you know to, to slow down. But everyone may not travel it regularly. They, may, they could be the ones that uh, cause. Right. Um, we will make sure we note that. We did call to Mr. Otterback's attention when um, Martin Luther King first opened, if you were coming from the Churchland area and it, you could go 45 and you didn't know when it first opened that that ramp was so sharp. Um, that they, we did call the attention, they changed the signs where they reduce, reduced it to 20 because I was one caught in flying, but I was it, within the speed limit for what it said, but didn't know that when I got around the curve, it changed to, it needed to change to 20. So if you come that way, you're seeing skid marks on the street all the time. That's, that's uh, it's very dangerous. Uh, so yeah. we've called it to their attention that they did change the sign. So we will definitely address what you've called to our okay. attention. You got We right. have that. Mm -hmm. Other traffic. Wow. <laughs> this is good. This is good. <laughs> Okay. Could you fix a road in front? No. <laughs> thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. All right, Madam. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council, we have two items on the city manager's report tonight, and I shall go through those. Uh, the first is um, 2017 Supplemental Local Emergency Management Performance Grant, and it's adoption of an ordinance accepting a Supplemental Local Emergency Management Performance Grant in the amounts of $6,330 from the Virginia Department of Emergency Management and appropriating the said amount in the FY 2018 Grants Fund for the use by the Department of Engineering uh, to purchase, maintain, and install flood sensors. And um, Mr. Um, Wright, would you tell them where those flood sensors are going? Bob. They're going to go, I know where they're going. Do you know? I don't have the information. Okay, um, it's going to be off of um, off of uh, Effingham in an area of which there has been um, flooding when we had the last storm. That's right. And they put the uh, grant in and we got the grant. So those sensors will alert people that the water, when the water is whatever high, people will know so police and others will not wade in the water and destroy their cars. Okay. The next one tonight is a easement uh, to Atlantic Coast Pipeline, LLC for natural gas pipeline and its adoption of a resolution authorizing the grant of utility access and related easements uh, to the Atlantic Coast Pipeline LLC encumbering certain property owned by the City of Portsmouth and located in Chesapeake and Suffolk. The background is Dominion Energy has joined with three other major utility providers to create an entity called the Atlantic Coast Pipeline LLC for the purpose of constructing a 600 mile natural gas pipeline extending from West Virginia through southeastern Virginia to southern North Carolina. In addition, a 70 mile lateral is planned for construction for the Virginia North Carolina border easement to Chesapeake, terminating at the Gil Gilmington Bridge. The city owns certain land in Chesapeake and Suffolk where finished water transmission mains are located and utilized by the Department of Utilities in its delivery of water to the cities of Portsmouth and Chesapeake. Dominion has requested that the city grant Atlantic Coast Pipeline LRC certain limited easement rights to allow the pipeline to cross the city's land and to allow the construction of a small access road across with a standard temporary construction easement. In your package, you have a um, visual uh, exhibit A and B, which shows you the 
small cut across in each of these areas of which they would like to uh, maintain line, uh, land for the easements that they are to construct. Um, Dr. Pat, uh, associated with that is a public hearing, right? Uh, tonight. Deborah? Yes. And um, this is, the public hearing is on the question of the easements, and we'll probably get people who will speak about the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Yes. But this public hearing is not about the pipeline, whether or not the pipeline should be built. It's about the easement. The easement. Uh, do I have your support to keep people on point? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Definitely. Yes, well, aren't those um, associated with each other? Because if you grant the easement, then the pipeline is built and there becomes a pipeline issue. So if they if they have a, if they have a concern about the pipeline itself, um, I don't see why that wouldn't be something that would be on point because by granting the easement, then that allows for the pipeline to be built. Let's say that somebody resides in Portsmouth but has property in Nelson County. Do we want to hear about their complaint about the pipeline going through Nelson County? That's not the purpose of this public hearing. Well. I mean, we've had we've had others to come here outside of Portsmouth to express concerns that, and they weren't part of Portsmouth. I hear you, but the, let's let's make sure that we have a majority. What is your feeling then? Yeah. This this yeah. public hearing is on the easement per se. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and then th there will be. I mean, and then they would go forth with the pipeline. Would that be a separate there's hearing? Another, that's, there's another no, venue. Yeah, that's that. above that's us. That's, us. That's, that's, that's not us. Yeah, that's way that's at other this levels. Yeah. And there have already been hearings on yeah. the pipeline all, the pipeline. all over the state. regional, all over the state. And this this easement's not the Achilles' heel. Oh no! no. I mean, if they don't no. get this easement, they could come back with Which another. Is, yeah. So little. It, all right. Um, also, we have a public hearing on a zoning application, and I just want to remind everybody that um, because we haven't had a zoning application in, in a while, that we decided to have the applicant explain the application, and we give the applicant 10 minutes to do so. So, uh, City Clerk, Madam Clerk, if you'll put the clock on. Yes. When we get to this point, I'll ask the applicant or the applicant's representative to explain the application and give them 10 minutes. So, so are, we, are we changing from the procedure where I thought planning was presented? Mm -mm. Not from the applicant, remember, we changed, we changed that. a long time ago. Oh, okay. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Two more oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Mayor, uh, be Mayor, members of council, before you, you have um, three um, report backs, written report backs. Uh, one, um, the city manager to confer with the city treasurer and schedule quarterly presentations before city council doing public work sessions and update on tax collection, investments, and savings. Uh, Mr. Page, Cherry, our city treasurer is scheduled to present uh, the requested quarter, first requested quarterly report on Tuesday, June 12th. Um, doing a public work session. Uh, you requested the city manager to contact Admiral Quinley uh, about federal funds for Effingham Street improvements. <coughs> Deputy city manager um, um, Vincent Jones talked with Admiral Quinley today, um, who is the executive director of the HRMFF. FA, and um, he provided that the funding source is called the Defense Access Road Program, that um, the program um, is not well funded, and um, that he would be providing us information on how to apply, but the amount that they have is not adequate for the request that cities would be making uh, for such projects as we have the Effingham Street. So he's going to get back with us and at least give us the information uh, as it pertains to an application. But we are going to apply. Right. Once he Even gets that, we're, I, I, my comment was if we got 50 cents, we would apply. That's better than zero. <laughs> exactly. Okay. <laughs> the, my, the staff knows that. The next uh, was a request city manager to come back with the, a study cost 
impact on the feasibility of providing a $75 monthly cost of living adjustment COLA for the widows and widowers of retired police officers and firefighters um, um, to be effective or considered in December 2018. The city manager, city administration, and city attorney's office are collaborating to bring back to city council during July, between July and August, a time frame, um, a comp a comprehensive discussion regarding the impacts and implications of any modification to the retirement payout for various subsets of employees covered under the Portsmouth Supplemental Police and Fire System. The assessment will be provided once all entities, legal, finance, human resources, the Retirement Board, Davenport and Company LLC, and John Hancock Retirement Plan Services have conferred about obtaining the latest information concerning the related subjects, which will occur in late June during the National Public Pension Attorneys Conference, of which our city attorney is attending. And lastly, uh, the request was, uh, what are the comparative salaries for superintendents and assistant superintendents in the region? The data provided before you is the comparative salaries for superintendents in the region, which is found within the handout before you this evening. The source of information comes directly from the FY29 budget books for each of the superintendents where the amount received is listed under salaries. Those pages are included. There were uh, not assistant superintendents um, in all of the cities, they, they call them different names, so we could not provide you with that information. I have one last thing, Mayor and members of council. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of city council, I am pleased to report that I have received an unsolicited proposal for a new city hall and public safety building from Amata Hofla. As city manager, I have accepted the proposal and will proceed in accordance with the Public Private Education Facilities Infrastructure Act, PPEA. During the June 11, 2018 public work session, the city's purchasing administrator will provide a general overview of the PPEA Act as adopted in 2002 and amended by city council in 2010. A notice will be put will be published in the Virginian Pilot tomorrow. That ends my. Uh, this brings us to City Council liaison reports, and I'll start. At, uh, <coughs> The Memorial Day Parade is this coming Monday at 10 a.m. <laughs> Yes, um, council uh, should uh, consider uh, putting item 18177 uh, back on the agenda. Uh, it was tabled at the last meeting. Uh, an agenda was circulated uh, through email with it on the agenda. And then we received a revised agenda where, where it was deleted. And so um, council should uh, consider a motion this evening to place the item um, back on the agenda. And we are. Yeah, we, we will. It will be. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have an appointee evaluations, uh, our annual evaluation, and uh, you, you have a schedule to. June 11th. June 11th. Mm -hmm. So we'll get the evaluation form out to each member of council. If you'll get it back in to, to me uh, by, let's say, May 30th. Mm -hmm. And we'll send it out electronic to you. Is that okay? Yeah, great. And that'll go out tomorrow. June 11th is the Monday. Monday. And that will be the only thing on the agenda? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Will, will that be in a form where we can type it or we just have to print it's it? It's a word again? document, so I'll so we can. Yes. Okay. Oh, that's okay. much better. Yes. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> much better. It, it just file it electronically, too. Yeah. Be, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. much better. More people read it. <laughs> and if you. You know, if you're concerned, make it a PDF copy. I, that's okay too. But it'll come to you in Word. Mm -hmm. 
All right. May 30th. Everybody on board for that? If we can type, that's great. <laughs> All right. We have, do we have a closed session tonight? No, Mayor. Okay. Well, then we'll adjourn the work session and have dinner and reconvene at 7 for the meeting.